The lac operon in E. coli is responsible for the production of the enzymes and other proteins that are going to be involved in the breakdown of lactose into glucose and galactose. The main protein that accomplishes this is beta-galactosidase. and beta-galactosidase is involved in cleaving lactose to form glucose and galactose. Beta-galactosidase is the product of the LAC-C gene. The cell does not want to produce all of these extra proteins, the, LAC, the proteins coded by LAC-C, Y, and A, unless there is lactose present in the cell and there isn't a better source of energy. The better source of energy would be glucose. So the LACSI operon contains systems to test that there is lactose present and there is not glucose present before it bothers producing the LACSI, Y, and A mRNA transcripts and then translating those into proteins. So for this sensing system, it's going to be using two different regions. The Cat-B region, and the Cat-B region is bound by the Cat protein. And the operator region, and the operator region is bound by the LAC-I protein. Both of these are regulated by small molecules. The CAP protein is regulated by the small molecule, CAMP, the secondary messenger, and the LAC-I protein is regulated by allolactose. So let's start with the LAC-I system first, and then we'll look at the CAP system. The LAC-I system is going to be involved in sensing whether or not there is lactose. If there is lactose available in the cell, then there will also be allolactose, and this allolactose will be able to bind to the LAC-I protein. The LAC-I protein is produced by the LAC-I gene, and we're not going to look at that right now, but that is located upstream of, uh, of the LAC operon. When there's no lactose in the cell, then LAC-I will bind to the operator. And that is going to prevent RNA polymerase from initiating transcription. This is under no lactose condition. If there is lactose available, some of the lactose is present in the allolactose form. And when there's allolactose around, this allolactose is able to bind to a site on the LAC-I protein that is not the DNA binding site. So the LAC-I protein has the DNA binding site. This is the interface between LAC-I and the operator. And it also has a site that binds to allolactose. So when there is lactose present in the cell, allolactose will bind to LAC-I. This binding changes the conformation of LAC-I, and it's going to disrupt the binding site where it would normally bind to the operator. So when there is lactose around, LAC-I will bind to allolactose. And it will not be able to bind to the operator. This is going to allow RNA polymerase to come in and initiate transcription. And this downstream will lead to the production of the LAC-ZYA transcript and the production of beta-galactosidase, the LAC-Y protein, and the LAC-A protein.
Usually when we're looking at the LAC operon, we're testing for the presence of beta-galactosidase. This is an easy test to do. Now let's look at the other half of this regulatory system, the CAP-B binding site. CAP-B will be bound by the CAP protein. Unlike LAC-I, the CAP protein is only going to be able to bind to CAP-B when it's allosterically bound by second messenger CAMP. CAMP levels are high when there is low glucose in the cell. So this is our glucose sensing system. So we have our system where the CAP protein is able to sense glucose and the LAC-I protein is able to sense lactose. When there's glucose present in the cell, then the CAP protein is going to not be bound by CAMP. When the CAP protein is not bound by CAMP, oops, let me drop, whoop, let me drop down here. When the CAP protein is not bound by CAMP, then it is not going to bind to the CAP binding site on the LAC operon. When there's no glucose, it will bind. And when there's high glucose, it will not bind. So let's see what happens when it does bind, when we have our low glucose condition. In our low glucose condition, we want the cell to be able to digest lactose, if lactose is present. So here, let's have our cat protein bound by CAMP, and this will allow it to bind to the CAA, CAP binding site on the LAC operon. When this happens, CAP recruits RNA polymerase to the promoter and helps to initiate transcription. So we will have the production of the beta-galactosidase protein that we can test for. So in order for our system to work, in order to make beta-galactosidase, we have to have low glucose levels so that the CAP protein can bind to the CAP binding site. And we also have to have lactose present to prevent LAC-I from binding to the operator site. Let's look at this all together. We have our cap protein bound to the cap binding site when it's bound by CAMP, a signaler of low glucose. And we have our LAC-I protein not bound to the operator. when it's bound by allolactose. Which is a signal of high lactose. So this is our situation when lactose is present and there's low glucose. So the cap protein will be able to recruit RNA polymerase to the promoter And the absence of LAC-I will allow RNA polymerase to initiate transcription of LAC-C, Y, and A. After translation, we will have the beta-galactosidase protein as well as the other two proteins in the LAC operon. So let's look to see what's going to happen if we actually 
lower the glucose or the lactose levels. So now let's have low lactose. So we don't have allolactose bound to lac I. And now lac I is free to bind to the operator. When lac I is bound to the operator, that is going to prevent RNA polymerase from entering the elongation stage. And so we won't get production of beta-galactosidase. This makes sense because we don't want to make beta-galactosidase if there's nothing for the beta-galactosidase to act on, if there's no substrate, if we have low lactose conditions.